background set up? Uh, if I could go in to touch some grass, it's going to be helpful for me. So I've, I've got the gas grass background. Be at one I with the true world. Office hours background. And I have an after hours background, which one should I do? That one's good. The after hours? Uh, it's not really Welcome, after hours. everyone, for uh, coming to episode two of the Halo. Uh, what I wish I knew Halo 2. Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, we've got a bunch of people already joining us. Yep, we're uh, Joe Burns is here twice. Welcome, both times. We have those happening again. It happens when you share the link out. Uh, yeah. Will's here, as always. Um, all right, let me start clearing my screen and getting ready to share stuff out and close my teams. I think we got a nice size crowd like the first episode. We got a nice size crowd in the second episode. So I don't know if it's going to be as informative as the first one. I'm hoping it is because we're going to have some guests, visitors in the audience. Oh, okay. I was, I was, <laughs> it took me for a second. I'm like, I'm sorry, you're inviting people here. I um, forgot who you were talking about. It's uh... Yeah, Tim Bowers should be with us and Reese should be back again. Oh, wow, my um, computer really does not like me right now. It doesn't. Um, Reese is here already. Hi, Reese. Reese is here already. Nice. Sam uh, asked a question. What's up? How are you all doing? Well, we're doing good. Answered live. We are good. Answered live. Yeah. If you really want to know the answer, I can talk for another hour. Uh, we don't have time for that. There's education to provide. There is education <laughs> to provide. We're waiting for more people to join. Yeah, we'll give them a few minutes. And my computer to catch up. Uh, Do you ever close all my windows while I get kicked out of the Zoom? I mean, if you close windows, you just restart your computer at that point. No, close all of my windows. Got jokes today, Mindy. I'm on Let's fire. See. If I like abruptly leave the meeting, it's not my fault, kind of. <laughs> uh, I just got some bad news. What's Maybe. that? One of your esteemed guests can't make it today. Tim can't make it? No. <laughs> So were you, were you left out in the cold again? Wow. Uh, uh, yes, this will also be posted to YouTube. Um, hope, but at some point, um, today's Wednesday, right? Uh, at least by the weekend. Yeah, today's Wednesday. Uh, okay. We did promise to make the next one, which is. Uh, at this well, point he said that last happen. time yep. so like also how many more we have a lot planned actually right we've got a lot of topics to cover <laughs> uh, let me clear this out okay it's this yes will <laughs> continue will there be an episode three um huh? we're not covering everything today so probably <laughs> <laughs> um where I, th I think that uh we, this might end up devolving into individual topics we'll just throw up on youtube we'll do some one-off recording sessions and just go through a deep dive of a topic after after we're done covering all of halo on these yeah, the what i wish to I get through basics first of yeah. like how to do specific things and then we can spin off like advanced automation stuff maybe I think I have uh, everything closed. Do we need to, do I need to make a poll? Do you want to make a poll? There are a couple questions that someone wanted us to ask um, that we can make a poll for. Uh, we did we not would... panic this time, uh, mainly because we've done this before. So we expected nothing to work right. <laughs> we've managed our expectations accurately. Yeah, there was no panic stage, except for when someone scheduled an appointment for me right before. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's uh, a recurring theme. So uh, I say we, we can get this uh, started. Mindy, are yep. you ready? I'm ready. I got everything closed. Luke, are you ready? Closing Slack as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Turn off the notifications. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get that done. I'm doing that too. Uh, <laughs> 
Focus mode. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, um, we are representatives of MSP Geek. Um, Mindy and I are admins. We run it. Uh, Luke is a very esteemed member of our community, uh, fan favorite, if you will. And uh, we are a nonprofit organization who cater to MSPs. You have questions, uh, somebody probably has an answer. Um, we have, what, 9,500 members in Slack and Discord between the two, somewhere around there. Uh, so if, if you haven't uh, joined us and you've been through one of the social media channels to come hang out with us today, uh, feel free to go to mspgeek.org and uh, come hang out. Um, it's free. I think that's important. Uh, Mindy, anything else you want to add to that? No, I think you covered it. Awesome. We spend all of our time there and don't do any actual real work. Well, that's not true. Uh, yeah, it's not true. <laughs> they have thoroughly tested the Outlook, uh, what it's capable of as far as HTML and CSS goes, and it's not much. Let me, let me state that for everyone listening. So, um, okay. Well, I'm pulling up Halo. So we have a specific set of topics we we're going to go over in this meeting, right? Anyone have what that write-up was? <laughs> First, we're going to talk about Azure AD and security groups, right? How do we sync our agents into Halo if we want to set up new users? And then um, some best practices when, or th things to think about when we're setting up security. Um, so uh, I was supposed to set this up in advance and I didn't. So we're gonna do it live. And if you happen to see my API keys and secret for Azure, uh, it's my home. So please don't hack it. <laughs> Andy, if you show that key and I have to edit that out of the video, you know how much of a pain that's gonna be? Yeah. Hey, everyone's getting print screen ready now. <laughs> everyone's getting print screen ready. <laughs> All right, um, where are we? Share my screen first. All right. Let's get my Halo shared visible. All right. That's my dev environment for Halo. And then let's go to. Um, so jumping right into this specific topic, we the way you set up, like Halo has a ton of integrations, and you can get to it from here. Just as a reminder, you can search, all right. So I can just search Azure and it should show up. Um, these are modules you can turn on and off by clicking the plus or X to turn them off. And what we're going to do with Azure Active Directory is actually set up a synchronization where your in Halo agents are the technicians, right? Your own employees. That's the terminology that they use. So we want to basically have the ability to sync uh, all of our MSP users into Halo um, so that Number one, you don't have to manually make the, make these risks. Very annoying. Number two, we can have permissions and roles sync automatically. And um, that way, when you get a new user, you set them up in 365, a new technician or employee, and they automatically get the correct access they need in Halo, as long as you have the licensing for it. Um, so we're not going to deal with single sign-on. We're just going to deal with the import of users and mapping of security groups and i've done it once in my life so hopefully we don't <laughs> run into issues yeah i've done it once and i think it was probably a bit longer ago than you did you yeah remember. exactly like it's not a huge deal it's pretty simple to follow through so here we're just going to do mendy online which is my home uh tenant and it's going to show you the things that you have to do like what's required in order to go through and do it um so we need to create an azure application which I am going to do in so, my... Yeah, so this way you can do it um, manually when you need to go create an app and set the permissions yourself. Uh, when you were creating it, there was also a new from PowerShell option where it will give you a PowerShell script you can run, which will go and do the setup for you. Correct, yeah. But I'm not doing it this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends how comfortable we are with PowerShell and. Yeah, with setting up apps, I'd probably recommend you do it manually just so you know what all the permissions are that you're giving it access to. Right. So here is the Azure tenant admin that's loading up. Um, 
So again, from inside 365 Admin Center, you want to go to the Azure, the Azure Active Directory Admin Center, basically, or just go to aad.portal.azure.com and log in with your 365. In this case, we want to go to Enterprise Applications, um, which is here or it's over here. It's You do not want to go to App Registrations, I think. Don't remember. I think you other do want to do an App Registration. <laughs> okay, other way around. I think. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> So we have, yeah, I think you're right. This is where we go. We're going to create a new registration. So again, this is the difference between the enterprise applications and the app registrations is that an enterprise application is an application from a third party that's going to integrate with your Azure. But the app registration is where the actual permissions and login access and API keys get generated from. So um, we're going to go to app registrations. And then we're going to create a new registration here. And we're going to be doing a single tenant in this case. Uh, ourselves only. Um, um, so I'd recommend you actually do a multi-tenant one because that then lets you leverage the app for your customers to sign in with their Microsoft tenants. So if you're doing single sign portal. on, yeah, and you have the CSP, right? I'm not a CSP. <laughs> <laughs> this is my hole. I'm just going to do single tenant in this case. Um, so this will be like Kudu Azure Sync. And then uh, the redirect URL URIs are going to be provided for you right here. Uh, so we're just going to copy this out and then paste it right here. And this is going to be web and then register. Um, so again, like with the, what Luke is talking about, like you're able to set up like your, there is a partner, a customer portal that your clients have access to, right? And do you want, you can either set up local logins where they log in individually with the accounts managed in Halo, or you can provide a single sign-on process where they use their 365 login to connect into um, the customer portal. And the way you would do that is using uh, Azure Sync connection with multi-tenanted to the partner account that has access to all of your clients' 365s. And that way so it can do single sign-on. You technically don't have to have CSP for doing the multi-tenant single sign-on. So for doing the single sign-on part, it's using the, I uh, just answer the question that someone anonymously asked. Um, the Azure AD is what you need for the sign-in parts of it and then syncing your own tenants. The CSP is for then when you want to sync your clients into customers and then bring in their users that way. Um, so for doing the single sign-on things, it would just be the Azure integration that we're doing now. You just do a multi-tenant app and then in the allow tenant section, you just add the tenant IDs. So that way you don't necessarily have to be a CSP and you can then still specifically allow tenants without doing the CSP connection if you wanted. So if oh, you want to leverage both CSP and single sign-on, you basically need the Azure AD uh, integration and you need the CSP integration. Okay, so, so that's under here, where is it, right? I'll just have to uh, change it back. I can't remember. Yeah, accounts uh, and yeah. Yeah. directory, any Azure AD yeah, directory is on tenant. Okay, so save that. Mm -hmm. So you're saying in here, I can I can add an additional tenant? Uh, no, so in, you add them inside Halo itself in the configuration once it's set up there. So how does so, it know to tie my Azure tenant or the app from my Azure tenant into someone else's Azure tenant for single sign-on? So on the first time you log in, they'll get the user consent thing pop up. And that's then doing an enterprise registration to your app, which is in your tenant. Uh, so you do an approval. And that's okay, how it gets linked into it. your customers. That's cool. So yeah, I learned something new. Nice. <laughs> so, yes, if you're blocking um, uh, automatic app, automatic like app things, yeah, or, uh, or you need to manually allow it. Yeah. yeah, so you either need to manually allow it in each of your customers to allow your right. app to let them sign in, or you can use something like SIP to push it out. Right. Yeah. So, guys, uh, by the way, like one of the ways uh, malware fishers are phishing people or whatever hackers are getting around MFA is by creating an application and having the user approved the login uh, and it's a real 365 login, they don't realize, and they're really granting access to the hacker to their own mailbox. So one of the steps that we that you can do to prevent that is as an admin, you can block users from uh, accepting or granting access to an application that's not approved, pre-approved, or you can set up an admin consent method where they can request the application and then as an admin, you can go approve it manually. Um, in those situations, that's what we were talking about, what Luke was saying. So it would go through that process where it would request access to the application in my tenant from their account, right? 
um, or give access to my application to their account that would then set up the single sign on. But if there is some sort of mechanism in place for security to not allow the user to grant that access, then it would have to be granted by admin ahead of time before they are able to do it. So that's interesting. Okay, so yeah, go do multi-tenant. Um, and then we would wanna build the permissions correctly. So the permissions that are needed are gonna be laid out for you right here. So we're just gonna remove user.read and throw in user.read all, remove this permission. And it says that they should be, it doesn't say, are these delegated <laughs> or application? That is a very good question. Because uh, the other CSP area does tell you, in this case, it does not tell you. Let's go uh, look at the actual documentation. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I guess you look it up. <laughs> um, Azure AD sync setup. Let's see. I think this is one of the things where there is actually pretty good documentation on it, at least. Let's see, but the, hard, the problem is finding the document versus finding the, the marketing page that says uh, that it does it, you know? Is the CSP integration listed? Uh, let's search for the guides. Does anyone have the answer in chat? <laughs> uh, I think I found it. The answer is set is up impersonation uh, delegated permission delegated permissions. All right, nice. Hey, make a note, Reese, on this page. Just throw that in here. Required API permissions delegated. <laughs> um, so we need user .read all, and that's under here. We're gonna add that permission. We also need. I could have just selected it and and then researched it. Right, researched instead of. Clicking apply. We want group.read. So here we can group read all. And then we want offline access, which is that. And now I have the remaining permissions. And now any of these need admin? Yes, we need admin consent. So we will grant admin consent from ND online. And now it's granted. Now the next part is we have to then do the exchange of the secret key, which I'm not going to show you, but we do need to grab the client ID and tenant ID. So the client ID is the application right here. We're going to copy that. And then we need the tenant ID, which is the third. It's funny how like these are out of order. This part is a tenant. The object ID is the ID of the <laughs> object that exists in 365. So you, ideally you need these two, right? In some cases you need the object yeah. ID, but not not when tying in applications. Yeah, pretty much uh, all the time when you're trying to authenticate with an application, it's the uh, tenant and the application ID you need or the client right. ID. Graph endpoint is gonna stay the same unless you're government or in uh, Germany or China. In this case, we're doing global service. And then of course, we're gonna get the secret and service, which I'm going to create right now. And then, We'll just do six months, who cares? Um, I just noticed, I think the, the general chat was set to not allow anyone to actually chat. So I think I've changed it so people can actually use that now. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I was wondering why the chat's not like, it's yeah. chat's not doing anything, like what the heck? All right, um, so I just pasted my Azure uh, sync and I'm gonna save it and then we can authorize, right? Uh, so yeah, so one thing the... Um, oh, no. Doc says you also need the open ID permission. So I'm not sure if this is correct or if the online docs are correct. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the API permissions and go add that in real quick, because why not? Uh, delegated also, or? Uh, uh, yes, it's saying delegated and then just- Because uh, probably ID for a single sign-on, no? Isn't that- Potentially, yeah, maybe actually, that could be it. Yeah, uh, so you also want to know um, grant. Okay. Uh, it doesn't require grant. Um, cool. Yep. <laughs> um, to actually authorize, I think after you said you have to go edit it again, I believe, right? Now we can authorize the application, yeah. uh, which will ask me to sign in with my global admin for my tenant that I am trying to sync. And save. Now, what happens here is basically you can now map 
fields that exist in abstract directories and fields that exist on um, in Halo for that agent. So if you had a custom field and you want to populate something in Halo, you can do that. Um, or if you wanted to reverse the first name and last name for some strange reason, you can do that too. Idea is it's like it's configurable, um, so you can do whatever you want here. Um, the agent field mappings and user field mappings are two different things, right? So in Halo, I believe every agent gets a user corresponding also. Um, and also the Azure sync will be allowed, like you can use it to sync in users from your clients and you can also sync it, use it to sync in agents, which are actual technicians and employees of the MSP. So you have the ability to control all that using the areas on this screen. Um, the site agent mappings are basically going to say uh, agent would go to um, Basically, if you have group mappings, this will this will apply the group mappings, but it'll also add this role as a default. So if you had a base role um, in Halo, then that would be the role that would you would apply to all users. And then you would just you can specify whether you want to include 365 external users like guests, and whether you want to retrieve their assigned activity of the users, and so on and so forth. Um, the advanced is where you actually choose the group in Active Directory. So if you had a group that exists called, say, like uh, Halo PSA Help Desk. And I can tell you at IntelliComp, we are not shy on using hyphens and spaces and fill characters. And I wasn't sure if it was going to work, and it just worked fine. Um, so Halo PSA Dash Help Desk, and then you'd have a similar like Help Desk rule, basically. That you would then map it to. And that's how you would create that mapping that would occur. It would basically say, if the user is in this Azure group, then put it into this role on Halo. Um, so that's how that would work. The uh, same thing allows you to automatically assign people to be like on the, cha the change control uh, board, the change advice board, they call it. Um, so you can automatically create, make people as approvers if they're within a specific group, um, and so on and so forth. And then the import is basically saying um, what the top period is saying, how, what are you, how are you going to match existing users? I'm going to go by email address and then email address. Um, if you had network login in Halo, you can map by network login. But ideally, email address should only exist on one person at a time, right? A person can't have more than one email. Or I should say the same email can't exist on more than one person. So that's the most unique field you'll usually be getting. In some cases, you may have the network login. Uh, it's very rare, but it is definitely possible for, I shouldn't say it's very rare, but it's definitely possible for a name to be the same on two different people, right? They could have John Smith or whatever common name you want to pick. Um, and then you don't want to match on that because you could be combining two different people. Um, this will basically set the agent, your user status in Halo to equal the account enabled property of the Azure user, which is very nice. So basically, if the Azure account's disabled automatically because the user has gone away, then it'll automatically disable the account in Halo as well, um, indicating that the contact or agent has, been, has gone inactive. And then the Halo integrator is the application that will runs all the backend integrations. If you're hosted, have support run it for you. Reach out to support, ask them to run it for you. If you're on-prem and you need to do it yourself, this is what you would turn on to allow the integrator to perform the sync automatically in the backend. Um, the last part, if we save this, there should be, here we go, import users, import agents. So now we can run the import, I got to actually create a map here, right? Um, not, to, not here, it's over here. I have to create a map, I think. So let's say agent. I don't have to fill in anything else. I'll just sure to my login activity. Oh, and I'm going to create a filter here because I only want to bring in people that are, I don't know, in this case, I'll do active account enabled equals true. But in reality, if you're bringing in everyone and they're inactive, they're going to be marked inactive, right? So it doesn't really matter to do this type of filter unless you specifically want to only see those people. Um, so let's save that, go back to imports, import agents. And now we should see a list of my accounts. 
Oh, because I checked off the I checked off the retrieve it. Hold on. I tried getting fancy. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh uncheck this button. <laughs> uh -huh. Right? And again, I didn't know that. I just happened to read the error message, by the way, for anyone who's watching. I don't I don't know that. The error message said it needed audit logs and I told it to capture sign-in logs. So it made sense. Here are a list of users of my tenant. Um, some of these are carryover from when I have on-premise exchange, right? The health mailboxes and whatnot. And then you can choose uh, the specific here, account principal green light. And so I'll choose this user and then I'll choose Mendy, uh, that's not helpful because they're all Mendy. Here, this user, Mendy Green. Why do I have two of them? Who knows? It's my own domain. Why do I have two of them in here? What the heck? <laughs> oh, this is the admin account. Okay. So we're going to choose that and then start at that point. And you can see this was added. And then the other one said username must be unique. I already have a username here, so it can't. It can't. Um, I'm guessing that my username is Mendy Green because my email address is different. Because otherwise, if the email address had matched, it would have updated the user and not told me that I can't do it. Uh, so one um, thing is when you um, when you're running any of the import or things in Halo, if you're getting things which are failing and it's not a really helpful error message, if you hit F12 and look at the console, sometimes you get some more useful errors that actually show up there. Um, so that's helped me fix things a good few times. Yeah. So in um, the Dev Tools under console, you'll see. Uh, what's going on and specific errors that are happening. And it does, like right here, you can see the previous error that happened. Calling principal have required MS graph versus audit log dot read all. Right. So I happened to read that message and go like, oh, audit log. Why do I want me why do I need the audit log? Oh right. I turned on gather sign in information. Whoops. <laughs> so in some cases, yeah, you may just have a message that says something like fail to import, check console. And you're like, what the heck is that? Right. <laughs> this is what it's talking about. Check the console. Um, and you'll see the results of whatever happened at that point. Um, uh, and uh, just to answer Josh's, Josh's question earlier about um, do customers need a M365 account to sign in? No, they, uh, you can set them up with just an email and password. And I think that you click a send welcome email button or set it to do it automatically. And it will just send them a username and password to log into the self-service portal. Yeah, Halo does have a native login process. So you can manage the password from within Halo directly without having to have single sign-on. Um, okay, so that basically covers the Azure Sync from the seat of my pants. <laughs> Let's go and talk about the actual roles themselves because there's only, there's only one thing that really I want to cover with the roles that, that people may not realize because it's not, it's not as common in PSAs, I think, um, is that you have the ability to stack the groups, okay? And the assigned permissions will follow the logic of whatever is granting the most permission is going to be followed. So if you have group A that's set to block access to something and group B is set to allow access to something and both groups are assigned to a single user, that user will be allowed to access it, okay? Which means that we want to build a structured set of groups that will collapse to each other with the base slash bottom or common or the default group you're going to give out will be the most restrictive, right? The least access, right? So you want that to be the bottom group. And then you would basically stack groups on top of people uh, to give them the required access they need in just specific areas, right? So the idea is, is like we have first line support and second line support. It's a perfect example here. These are default groups that exist, right? And you can see that if you look here, um, there's preferences that show up, these combine two. Here are permissions and they are uh, a lot. <laughs> they are complicated, they are a lot. They're not necessarily greatly worded. They're maybe vague and you'll have to figure out what they're referring to. Um, but the thing is, is like the first line in support and second line support will most likely have, I went too far, will most likely have similar access and for our permissions, they may have one or two things slightly different, right? Or they may be different, but not even in this area. They may be different in terms of what actions they can perform or, uh, or what, what things they can do on a ticket specifically or what areas they have access to um, uh, to change within the configuration itself. There's like a whole other access control thing over there. Um, but these may be the same, 
And let's say that a company policy exists where technicians don't have access to invoices. And then six months later, it decides, you know what? They have access to partial stuff within the invoice, but they can't actually send one or anything like that. Maybe they can look at the historical ones or whatever. If you, you had seven or eight groups that you had to jump through and remember the settings that you're doing at maintaining across seven groups, it's going to get very complicated to do, right? Instead, what we can do is we can just clone. I'm just going to clone this one to make it easy. What is called is base uh, role, right? Or default role or whatever it is that you're going to be doing and say, Every single person that has access to Halo is going to have access to X, Y, Z. That could be tickets, that could be, you know, pending sales or whatever. And you would basically configure this default role with those permissions that you would need to have. Let's say we don't want them to be able to modify users, so they can just view only and they can um, read and modify only. Right? I went through and deleted, like, removed all delete permissions on our side. We don't want anyone deleting anything. We don't want reporting access because FYI, if you have access to reporting, uh, they can basically do anything they want in terms of pulling whatever data they want, right? Yeah, if so you have reporting the access. to create a reporting, a report stuff, they have read-only access to your entire SQL database. So yeah. just be so wary just, about giving that out. <laughs> you can just go and write any SQL query you want. So yeah, yeah reporting is very scary and powerful. Yeah. Here, we can just read, read only that. And I'm just basically setting my own um, read and modify own only instead of read and modify all or read only. Uh, my, I'm basically creating a default role that's going to exist and every single user is going to get this role. Okay. Um, I'm also going to assign, let's see, do I have any departments and teams created here? I don't remember. Yeah. So I have a bunch of teams. I'm going to create this role and I'm going to assign the default role to every single team that exists in a non, let's see, first line, second line, all these things, let's say, right? Maybe not project managers because they don't have access, they don't need, or infrastructure, but they may need access to see all the tickets, right? If they need to see a ticket in a team, they need to be part of the team. So everyone who's going to be able to see all the tickets in Halo should be in every single team. Now, you may not want them to be able to be assigned to them, right? And you may be... Um, Maybe you only want them to see unassigned tickets or only tickets that are assigned to other people, right? But they do need to be in the team. So we're gonna save that. And this is the membership that's gonna show up. Every single person in this role will automatically be put in here, right? And they'll automatically get all these permissions, okay? So that's the default role. And then um, we would then go add literally every single agent into this uh, role like that, save. Okay, what we would then do is say uh, account manager is special. And we're gonna, I'm actually gonna build a brand new group just to show this off. Let's say we have help desk manager. I don't think that exists right now, right? Um, or we could actually, we just call it customer manager because I'm gonna do something. And we're gonna assign Luke, who's a brand new person in our tenant to be customer manager. So Luke, now you're responsible for everything. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for Luke, he actually has project managers because he's a customer manager. He can't be assigned to necessarily, right? Because he's not doing the work, but he's, he's, he should know what's going on so he can see that team. And then for permissions, because he's the manager, I'm going to do things like um, read and modify clients. And uh, there's a contract thing here somewhere. So we're going to read and modify contracts, that, which I took away before, right? And that's it. I'm just going to leave everything else not set. So now I only have literally a minimal group doing two things that will combine with the default group to give Luke everything that he needs. Now I'm going to jump into Luke real quick. And I happen to grant him administrator role. I'm going to take that away so that we can see this happen. Notice we have two roles here, default role and customer manager. And if you look at the permissions, you'll see uh, where each one is inherited from. So it collapsed to provide you a single set of permissions based off of the roles that were in there. So let's go back to contract and notice that he inherited this from customer manager. So you can really build a um, least privileged access set of groups, right? Everyone who gets Halo access is gonna be in every single team who can see all the tickets that are gonna be generally open for people to see, 
right? So we block our internal tickets, things that have to do with our internal infrastructure and data center that are only visible by a few clients, a few technicians. We take those tickets away from everybody else, but everything else is visible. Um, and then you assign uh, a Halo group in Azure and map that Halo group to your default role. Or you can just throw that default role in every single user that comes into Halo from that original tab, the first tab, before we mapped the, the group to, uh, to a role, right? Um, so this will allow you to build a complex uh, permission set. And the best part is six months down the line, we go, you know what? We really shouldn't be giving everyone access to X, Y, Z. Well, I'm not going to 17 groups to change it. I'm gonna to go to one default role and I'm gonna change this one thing and say, well, um, they don't need access to CRM. They're causing problems there. And now everyone has lost access to CRM unless they have an additional role that specifically grants them that access. Okay, so that, that's the only thing I really want to go over um, with groups. It took me a while to come up with that kind of system. Um, what we ended up doing is we actually create our roles to be uh, named for what they're doing. So we would basically say, uh, this is granting permissions. And we would say, this is granting a team, right? So the only thing that's happening here is a team. Uh, we're assigning a team to infrastructure in here. That's it. Oh, I did not save that, did I? <laughs> Let's try that again. Team, right? So now our list of groups are is made up of literally just groups that are split by team or by role. And uh, the ones are permissions. The ones that are granted permissions are called permissions dash and then whatever permissions they're getting, base or help desk or projects. And the ones that are giving them access to teams are gonna be team dash and then whatever team that they're granting access to, which will basically allow us to, there's no permission set. So it doesn't matter, like we can just move them in and out of teams or make whatever changes we want on the fly uh, very granularly without having to do a lot of overhead work. Um, okay, so I uh, think so that covers. Yeah, go yeah ahead. one thing to add is um, when you change permissions, it doesn't apply until the user next logs out and logs back in. Um, essentially, when they're logging in, they're being given an OAuth token in the background, which has the permissions in it. So, for example, where many remove my admin powers, where I still logged in, I was able to go in and re add myself to the admin group again because um, I still had that. <laughs> Let's see, Luke is, uh, where was it? I think I passed it. Back up. Yep, yeah, back in administrator. <laughs> yeah, so that's a very good point. It's like Windows, right? If group permissions don't refresh until the login occurs. Um, all right, so that is, we did Azure Sync, we did groups. Um, what are we doing next, Luke? What was, what was next part? Contracts. Contracts. contracts and recurring Amazing. invoices and billing profiles. Okay. Do you want to take over for this one? <laughs> I can take over for this one if you'd like. Yes, I am still very new <laughs> to this. You know, I, I, I've done it recently and I think I know it, but I'm not, I don't know it well enough to give it over yet. <laughs> I think I can do it most of the time. I'm sure I'll need to um, pester Reese for some bits. Like I haven't done the billing plan combinations and templates in a while. So <laughs> I might need to refresh on that. That's okay. We can figure it out. Um, do you want me to? Do you want me to stop sharing and then you can share? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think. Oh, I think you just do it anyway. Uh, let me find the right window. All right. There we go. Cool. Cool. Uh, so I've made a handy loops testing company. So with invoicing in Halo, I found the best way to do it is if you first make a contract, then off that contract, you can hook the recurring invoice um, or multiple recurring invoices. Uh, it just makes it a little bit more organized as it's used. I think you can just go and make a recurring invoice straight away without a contract, um, but I've always done it off contracts. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, so make a contract. It always places you to reselect the company even when you're making it from the company. Um, generating a, ah, generating the contract, contract reference as well. It's sometimes hit and miss. Sometimes it randomly pulls a different customer's name in there, but today it's working. Uh, so typically here you'd set your 
effective, your start date of the contract, how often you're going to bill um, the labor on it. So if you're doing like, it, this is when you're including a certain amount of hours. Uh, so you'd say, I'm going to give them 100 hours monthly. Uh, and then you can also set a cost in that. I'm not sure if that feels through to actually charge anywhere, but we'll see. Uh, and we'll just have unlimited amounts of periods on that. Um, then most of this other stuff you can just ignore or you could set like a different SLA. If you've got some like multiple contracts for a customer and some things they have on a higher SLA than your standard one. So once you've done the basics, if we save that, you can then go to the recurring invoices part. So this is where you are saying how you're going to actually invoice them, what they're being charged for, what the line items on their invoices, uh, things like that. So if we make a new recurring invoice and we want to do the schedule. So this is basically saying, how often are they being billed? How often do you need to generate the invoices for? What kind of period are they for? And are you billing ahead of days or are you just billing on days or how does that kind of thing work? So, so what are the different schedule types that we have there? So we have- This is a screen that I found confusing <laughs> a little bit. You know, the first few times I open, I'm like, what is this doing? <laughs> So I typically do start date and repeat period. So that will be, we would normally set it to the first and that's then gonna bill on the first of every month, create the period that way. If you mm -hmm. bill from the day that they onboard, you could do it so it's mid month and then that will bill on the 20th of every single month. Okay. Then selected days of the week. So I think this is where you could say like, bill on the last day of a month or something or the first day of a month or the first Monday of a month and things like that. So that depends really how you're doing your billing and what period you bill from. So we do from the first. Oh, interesting. Nice so if, if you're setting this, let's say you were choosing selected days of the week, does that mean it's going to be the way you're currently set right now? Is it going to bill the first Monday of the month? Or that should do. So in theory, this should then bill on the 1st of August. Should be the first one. Find I a think. different Monday. <laughs> Oh, uh, your so yeah, start not... time is July 20th. Yeah, so I think if you did the first of the month, first Monday, that should mean the first one that it would raise would be the 1st of August, but I'm not sure if that's right. Yeah, so I think Reese is saying that. It is will the bill case. the first Monday of the month. Okay, and if you yeah. wanted it to bill on the first of the month, regardless of whatever day it was, you would choose all the days, basically. Yeah, so you could do a start date and then repeat on the first. Or... Right, yeah, you could do that too. Right, interesting. Um and then, and then this, this screen was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even looked at this one. <laughs> yeah, so what I think this is basically doing something similar, but you're actually uh, setting um, the date of the month here is basically, it's not really picking a date, a date and year from a date picker. It's like first, second, third, fourth, fifth day of that month. Mm. And then the, the send on this month, is basically one through 12 is which month they're going to send it on right yeah or you can do zero and have it go on every single month and then how often you want it to repeat would be i mean it's recurring invoice so you want it repeating at some point right so yeah. you don't want it to be zero well zero, one would be every month two would be every other month i don't know three every three months i guess <laughs> yeah every three months that's i that's kind of what makes sense yeah and then four, one every month to every other month so three yeah. would be every quarter and then the same thing with the years where one is every year, two is every two years, and three every three years, et cetera. Um, Dimitri is asking if there's a way to queue invoices to review before they're actually sent. So there is a way for you to send invoices automatically when they get generated. Um, I think Luke is gonna get into that at some point towards uh, the I assume there's a tick box, we do it manually. So we'll generate yeah, so, all the invoices But first. by default, I think, uh, Dimitri, the invoices get generated, but they do not get sent out automatically. So you have to go manually send the invoices, right, after they're generated. So you can review them and then send them out. Um, but if you wanted to, and you were brave, you could turn on the automatic sending and just have it all go out and then deal with whatever issues come up after yeah. the fact. There's also an automatic generation as well. So you can literally just say, yeah, just send all the invoices out and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're, we're not that brave. Yeah. <laughs> Neither is Dimitri, apparently. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the schedule types. Sorry for jumping in on there. 
Cool. Uh, so let's go back to nice and simple. We'll send them the first <laughs> and then repeat every month. And that will do for us. <laughs> um, one other thing, by the way, before we hit save, um, there is a number of days ahead of schedule to create, FYI. So uh, what that does is if you want to put it on the last day of the month and you still want to stay in a simple interface, you can choose the first and then set that to one and it'll do it the day before the first. So that'll always be on the last day of the month. Um, so that's what that thing is for. Basically, how many days in advance do you want it to uh to create it before it's scheduled to create i don't i mean it's literally just like another way to manipulate the day before creation again we're not talking about automatically sending out right this is all about generating those invoices not sending it out automatically yeah. so yeah it's just so another way your, to, this only that. really comes into effect i think if you've got the automatic generate invoices turned on rather than the manual generation okay yeah that makes sense Right. Okay. So there. So you're manually generating and manually sending out. Yeah, that's how we do it. Because okay. we like to do. So we did one monthly invoice, but we got multiple different recurring invoices and labor and like one off item costs, which you merge into a single invoice. Mm -hmm. So we'll do it manually, so we can select we want all of this stuff to be on the invoice, generate that onto one invoice. Right. But if but we are able to set it. I think that you can do an automatic generation of the invoice. As long as the invoices are generating on the same day, they will roll up together. Like yeah. any recurring invoice, or is it just any invoice that's being generated that day will roll up together into one invoice. I think yeah. so. I've never been brave enough to try it because <laughs> every month we have to, there's things we need to tweak and avoid. <laughs> so. um, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Let's save that. Exactly. So. <laughs> Did you save it? No, I saved it. So oh, now yeah, got, okay, yeah, got it. We're in the recurring invoice. Uh, so, oh, we've got ad group items. I haven't actually seen that yet. Interesting. Um, so one thing I noticed that messed me around is this uh, bill in advance here. So if you're billing, so this is for when you're doing proration. So. If you're billing in arrears, you do it to zero. That means it's going to um, not bother to prorate anything into the future. If you bill in advance by one term, it's going to be you've already pre billed a thing, so it's going to go up to the next um, end period that you build. Or if you bill in advance with two terms, that's for when you're billing like two months in advance. And so it just you're basically telling Halo how it needs to do the proration onto items. So we do a month in advance. So I'm going to leave it like that and we can show some proration stuff in a minute. Um, you can set your due dates and manually override it. So if you've set them at the client level or at the global level, leaving it as default, will just filter that through. If you've got a special agreement with a customer where they've got a longer terms in this specific invoice, you can then set the due date there and override it. Um, and then you can add various different other bits, add notes and things. Uh, when you've got, uh, I guess that's actually in the later stage, uh, so we've got no line items, so it's never going to do anything. So if we come in here and add a recurring line item, um, let's have a look and see what is a good one. So let's say what items has Mendy added. I haven't added any. These are all stock. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, you can right. do like workstation support if you want. I think I added that one or whatever. Manage so service right. charge. That's cool. We're going to add a managed service charge. So if you want to do single items of static quantities and things. You can just add items like this, set the price, set the quantity, save that, and that's then on the invoice. But we don't want to do that. We want to automate some things because um, we don't want to waste time having to update quantities every month. So right. this is where we should start to get some cooler things in here. So, so in like this case, we're talking about being able to update the quantity automatically, right? Because we don't want to, so, like, the worst part is having to go back to your invoices and have to, like, okay, you have five, 50 customers, go to each single one of them and update the recurring invoice line items at the correct quantities every single time. It's the worst feeling in the world. Um, <laughs> so in order to use this, there's a setting you have to turn on, right? Yep, I guess we should probably show you people that. Yeah, you should is. show them where that is, because <laughs> I was not able to find it earlier today until we found so, it, Kyle found it. I the think end. it's in <laughs> filling recurring invoices. Yeah, And then That's it's it. this tick box, allow recurring invoice line quantities to be calculated using license user and asset counts. Now there's a small fine print 
for that checkbox <laughs> that exists. It's not the end of the world, uh, at least for us. But basically saying that if you're if you turn on this item, this option to have the quantities automatically be calculated based off uh, user and asset counts, then that means you can no longer right delete. Um, what is it? Users and assets. Yes, yeah, so you can no longer delete users and assets, but you can make them inactive, which is for all intents and purposes, it hides them enough that they are deleted. Yeah, exactly. You can't permanently um, remove them from the database after that point, but you can. Um, you can mark them inactive, which is what you should be doing anyways, in, in my mind. That's why I think it's not the end of the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then also you've got allow if you want to um, do negative pro rating or not. So with the changes to NCE, we're dropping that pretty much. We used to do it, but. What, what's the reason for soft. negative pro rating? It was basically if they decrease licensing, you'd credit yeah, that so back. Yeah, so if you, yeah, if people decrease licenses mid-month, you can, you credit it back. Got it. Yeah, with Microsoft NC, that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so this is where the cool things come in. So on the quantity, we can then choose, do we want to do it from a license count, a subscription count, the user count, or the asset count? So this is where you can start depending on how you're billing. So if you're billing per workstation, you'd link it to assets. If you're billing via users, you'd link it to users potentially. Um, if you're billing by using the CSP integration, so you're syncing across the licenses that are listed in Microsoft 365, that adds them as license counts. If you're synchronizing things using the Pax8 integration, that brings them across as subscriptions. So if you have a look, I prepared some subscriptions and licenses earlier. So if we have a look here, ah, oh, maybe it didn't actually add it. Subscription all. Okay. Well, maybe it didn't like my one that I made. Let's try the licenses instead. Yeah, so I did an example software, software license. Um, so I think on with the subscription ones, the advantage of that is it will show you the term period, whereas on the license ones which come from CSV, you don't see the term. So if you sync from your distributor, you get your term period on at least the NCE licenses, whereas otherwise you can't see that. So you should be able to get a drop down on subscription showing with their monthly or yearly, I think they're adding it in the next version of Halo to actually see that. So it will make life a lot easier. Um, here you can do an included quantity free. So if you've got like an admin account that you don't bill people for licensing their tenant, you could do a quantity of one here and it won't invoice it. Um, and you can also then only include licenses that have actually been assigned to users and synced over. So if it's not been assigned, they won't get billed even if they've got the licenses in their tenant. So does that mean that means the license has to be associated to a user in Halo, basically? Halo has to yeah. sync the license association to the contact in Halo. And then yeah. it'll only so in reality, you're really only billing for users that have a license assigned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you that's really that cool. One. Yeah, that's awesome. So if we uh, da -da -da, leave the cost, leave the price. So you can also do some calculations around price. So you could pull it from that's its own contract or the user's own contract creation. I've not actually played with that. So I'm not entirely clear on how they work. So we won't touch that today. Uh, so if we save that, we'll then have a magically generated invoice. We have one quantity there. So if we go and raise an invoice of this, uh, do ready for invoicing. Find my testing client and create an invoice. Voice two has been created. So this has now created it without actually sending it to anyone. You generate the PDF and have a look what it looks like. If you've got an integration like Zero set up, it also will synchronize it to Zero at that point and it pulls your invoice number from your accounting software. So that's how we found the best way to align our invoice numbers and get them what we wanted was actually do the integration and then when it creates an invoice, it just gets the right invoice number from zero rather than trying to have an invoice number two being generated. Um, so I, I think Reese like is that. playing with her test in her instance. <laughs> <laughs> See if they do that thing where they upgraded it but didn't upgrade the PDF thing in the background. Oh no, just taking oh. our pop-up blocks. There we go. Dodgy website doesn't like it loading. <sighs> Cool, so that's then using whatever templates you've set up to generate it, going to make the actual invoice. Yep, and there's so, the actual invoice itself. 
Um, Robbie yeah. wants to know if we can sync reoccurring invoices into zero um, or so, if it would otherwise negatively affect zero's reporting. I'm not sure what so that So the recurring means. invoice doesn't sync, but each individual invoice you generate in Halo does then oh, sync that's into zero. What you mean. Right. Okay. So the recurring invoice is not a real invoice. I think it's just a it's just a setting in Halo, like a scheduled task, to create an invoice on a certain date and time that you set up set up with specific yeah. line items that you set up. And then <laughs> when that date and time fires, either you manually generate or automatically the invoices will generate, and then those generated invoices will end up into uh, zero. Like Reese said, a recurring invoice is like an invoice template. Um, yeah. So, so if you, it's quite interesting how they do it. So yeah, for intents and purposes, the, the recurring invoice is just a template on how to make the invoices, but how they store it is actually just, it is an invoice but with a negative ID in the database. It's quite funny when you're looking and finding them. It's like, why are all these things with negative ID numbers? What's going on? That's um, so we've generated that. And what we want to have a look at now is the proration side of things. So if we go back to the client. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah, that never works for me, the history there. So yeah, when you do the synchronization, when you do the synchronization, you have the CSP one will just synchronize and update these automatically, but you can also update them manually yourself. So rather than having to go, if you've got things which you're mapping and keeping track of different software licenses for a customer, you can just map them all in here, do it manually, or use the API to update things yourself here. And then you just map from here out to your actual invoices. So it just makes it a lot easier than having to go into each individual invoice template to update things. You can just update quantities in here from one place. So if we go and up this to two, what we should have back on that recurring invoice is quantities updated. And if we have a look on here, fingers crossed, we'll have a prorated line item, which we don't have. <laughs> Um, so why don't we have a prorated line item? So bringing one in advance. Did that. Hmm. So we, well, do, do you know why line, we don't item, have a prorated line item? Was the line item set to prorate? Yes, it's set to prorate. I think it was. Let's double check. So on the mapping here, all right, from the date the change occurred. So yeah, we should okay, have a prorated so, item. Uh, Reese, fix it. Numbers two. <laughs> So yeah, it picked up the quantity change, we didn't do it. So maybe it only does it when it's updated through the API potentially rather than manually. That make I mean, sense. what if it's, no. is it just today though? Like you're, it well, has both, a... both were done today. So how's that gonna, how's that gonna happen? That's Christian. Oh wait, is it cause we've created only don't from have a the schedule first set. to the seventh. So maybe we've got- You don't have a I'm schedule set cause... according to Reese. Yeah, so, uh, right, wait, we do have a schedule set. There is a schedule set here. That's schedule. It's right there. Uh, I think it's because we've only billed for this month already. So because we not billed in advance yet, it hasn't so done therefore it. It's so therefore, you have to backdate yeah, so think, everything. Yeah. Hold on. He <laughs> says active equals no in the schedule. Active oh. equals no. In, oh. There was an active as no, but. I mean, look, he's the expert. I'm just repeating. I'm just sounding like the expert. <laughs> I'm going to start adding recess and just say it. So I can look important. Aha. Uh -huh. Save. Now update it again. So let's say, uh, I reckon we need to raise one in the future as well, because I don't think it will prorate otherwise. But let's have a look and see. So let's do M period August. No, I <laughs> don't want to be interesting. Did we do an expiry date of already? 
There's no next creation date set. Why is it not a next creation date? It sets in on it. Oh, right. It's it's deactivate. First. All right. We've got an end date of already. That's why it wasn't active. Oh, that's Aha. Why. There we go. Next creation date is blah, blah. Right. Okay. Active, yes. There no we go. Date. There we go. <laughs> Look, it takes three of us plus someone. Come on, get the staff. <laughs> They're doing it live. Right. End of August. Should now get an invoice. There. Awesome. Cool. Let's create that one. Let's go and change the uh, software license. Which is okay, actually looking at customer. Why is that now gone? What to do? <laughs> I mean, there was software license there a second ago. Uh, did it somehow, did it go inactive? Or is it showing? Oh. It's not an inactive. No, there's there. not an inactive there. This is beautiful. This is fun. <laughs> um, did it move over to a subscription? It shouldn't. Right? It's two different areas. No, yeah. Okay, so it has moved over to the subscription. Weird. <laughs> okay, well, I think we found a bug at least. Can uh, we and... recreate that? <laughs> Wait, but now it's... Huh? <laughs> so that's from a license count. That's yeah. changed to three now. Right, because you but then we three. didn't get a prorated item. <laughs> Right, this works a lot more reliably <laughs> when I've done this on my own. <laughs> you know, Mindy does have the effect of not having things uh, work Reese when he's like, around. Look, I'll be honest, you and I'm baffled. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Reese, you want to come up here and uh, try to explain this away? This is all my fault. Um, this is this is a, <laughs> by the way, we're on the beta version, FYI. So we can just blame the beta version. Um. Also, I don't even have the subscriptions tab for your for your company. You might need to reload. I turned on Pax Eight to get it. To oh, you off. turned it on. Okay, got it. So, yeah, yeah, we mapped to licenses, not subscriptions. That's even more weird. Right, it doesn't make sense that it would move from licenses to subscriptions, but. Yeah, but then it was definitely updating the subscription. It's definitely quantity. doing it. Okay, so we've got three there. Let's go try and update that. The heck? Oh, there's a change history. <laughs> have we answered the questions that have been asked? No, we have not answered the questions not yet. yet. <laughs> there, so, well, there's one. So Robbie was pointing out that um, an, act, an active user making a ticket. So if so an active user emails in a ticket to the system, the ticket will show up as invisible to anyone who doesn't have rights to see those inactive people. Um, I don't remember if that's a permission setting to hide inactive users or whether only admins can, can see it. Um, I don't know if Luke knows that offhand. I don't. I've, I've got a feeling I saw a permission about it at some point or a setting. Yeah, I, I vaguely recall that too. But, you know, honestly, I would just go to the roles area and search for inactive and see what you find. <laughs> Control F, inactive. I'm going to do that right now and see what happens. Uh, in reference to Sam's question about uh, he's having issues sending out invoices 14 days ahead of the next month, which is which is the, of the which the invoice is for. He can do the period ahead, but making the invoice due on the first by setting it due 14 days later does obscure things. Is there a go to method? Uh, I believe to simplify that you can just set the generate invoice day field right in recurring invoices. There's a like you can yeah, specify I'm not sure how that then feeds into the due days though. Well, if you generate it 14 days ahead, but it's for the first, it should stay 
should be due on the first. If unless I'm misunderstanding something. Due on the first place. So if I yeah, I'm not sure on that one. I don't think. Yeah. So if I start date on the first repeats monthly, but I number of days ahead to schedule to create and I do 14, the due date should, you can set the due date separately. That's what Megan's saying. So, oh, you can set the due date. Uh, Go back to the recurring voice, Luke. <laughs> yeah, it's, on, it's underneath schedule. You can uh, generate it 14 days and do And hit. So yeah, so you can generate it point days ahead, but that would be generating it dated the first, I think. So then the due date would be the fourteenth. If you've got uh, I just want to point out, days. it doesn't matter anymore because Reese says I'm right. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I don't, I don't think he's. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I think Megan's correct because you can set the. So if you hit save here, uh, and then you do the, fourteen days over here. So yeah. I wonder what issue Sam's hitting. So you should be able to set that do 14 days after the invoice date and you generate it 14 days beforehand, it should generate the invoice uh, on 14 days before the month starts and the due date should be the first. Can we generate an invoice and find out? Yeah. But you got for it or work. I just noticed yeah, the probate just finally showed up. So, <laughs> yeah. And you just go oh, down and you see it, right? There you go. Yep. yep. The changes so that happen to the licenses should... So yeah, what could you do differently to make them show up? Um, that is a brilliant question. <laughs> I remapped <laughs> it to the subscription. I updated the quantity and I hoped for the best. And then it just appeared like a few minutes later. So maybe there's something that needs to process on the like the uh, scheduled task that runs in the background every few minutes. Maybe right. that's so, what's so let, the So let's back up stuff. a second because there's a conversation going back and forth between someone whose name I'm definitely going to uh, mess up. So I apologize in advance. Turge? Turge? And Reese is going back and forth about how the count of licenses and count of subscriptions actually update the quantity on the recurring line item. So we just want to drill into that a little bit and see if we can clear up some of the confusion here about that. Um, the way it works, and I think what Reese is trying to explain is that it's two separate independent items, Terge. One, one is the line item on the recurring invoice. The recurring invoice, uh, it's an actual item that exists in your inventory, so to speak. Uh, it's a recurring item that exists in your in your inventory with the uh, uh, actual item code, a tax code and pricing and so on and so forth. And then there's under a client, which there's no global area for this. It's, the client is where they live. You have uh, subscriptions and you have software licenses, which until 10 minutes ago, I thought were completely unrelated and would never cross each other. <laughs> um, but apparently just somehow jump from one to the next. Um, so what, the way it works is that the recurring line item that you put on the invoice is tied to a recurring item in your inventory. And you tell it to calculate the quantity of that item based off an existing subscription. So it's gonna to go to the database and say, how many subscriptions do you have of this kind? Um, if you edit that line item, Luke, um, and sure. what you'll so see- here, So read, so you essentially you add the line item onto the invoice and then you come down here and it's the calculate quantity is what you want. So this right. is where you can then do that mapping. So- yeah. The key is, and Luke went through this really quickly, the key is when you click add uh, for it, you choose which license to select from. So he already has the only license that we have in there. So we can't. Yeah, so can't I did that. have an example one there. No, so we can do it on a subscription um, because the this, this license decided to turn into a subscription for some reason. I think it's because I called them the same thing. So yeah, I think we found a bug at least. Oh, got it. Yeah, so, so um the way, like you would choose which one at that time when you add it to the recurring line edit, which means that you're not, you don't have to go back and tell it when you're updating the quantity under the software licensing or subscription under the client, you don't need to tell it which line item to update. It's already mapped. If the line item is already assigned to that type of software or subscription. Um, to make this easier, if Luke can go rename to different names, like a couple more, just a couple more softwares, like software one, software two, or maybe like Huntress and, and I don't know, Defender or some, some sort of third wall or whatever um, cool. in there. All right, so let's add a new one here. Software license. Called Huntress. Yep. Give that three licenses. 
Let's save that. And none of this has to do with billing at this point. Just keep that in mind. What we're doing here is we're just tracking software licenses for the client. It has nothing directly to do with billing at this point. It's only when we tie it into the recurring line item that's when it that's when it starts messing with okay. billing. So we made a software license, but it's and showing it on the subscriptions. subscriptions. What the heck? <laughs> I thought they were entirely separate, but I'm guessing they're not. Well, there's a bug where this is actually just what making. What changed? We are on a beta version. But it was showing. It let us map it as a software as a license first. I don't Weird. know what happened. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like Sam James got his answer. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> I was like try typing all this stuff out, and I'm, uh, I look up, getting ready to hit enter, and then she's already answered the question. And... Also, fair warning, if you set a default due date in your ticket settings and in your recurring invoice, they will add together. Uh, and Sam's like, that's it. <laughs> We're going to mark that as answered live. Cool. Glad um, I was able to poke everyone's Reece, questions. Do you have any idea what's going on with these software licensing and subscriptions? It's a beta. That's what I'm going to go with. So we've done, now we're creating one software and one. So when we created sense. licenses, they're just appearing as subscriptions. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Okay. So here, notice, so notice, oh yeah, go back to that drop down. Notice that there's there now we have the two different licensing or subscriptions that we can select to say which ones should be for the item that we're putting in, right? So it's not like you have to then go select when you modify the quantity, it's going to automatically update that quantity on that recurring line item that's targeted. I almost said tied. I changed it to targeted in the middle, targeted <laughs> to the subscription or license that you select at that time. Um, this is this is 95, by the way. The version we're on is 95.8. Is that a thing? 95. Dot something. Uh, 95.8. Yeah, 295.8 is the version that we're on right now. Someone's hacking our system. If Mose, if you if you add a software license, does it show up under licensing or does it go to subscriptions? I'm so lost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, yeah, Reese's I think it must just be. A... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What, okay, I'm just gonna blame Luke. It's in his test. Yeah. He did something for just him. for the record, this is recorded, so we'll play back what exactly happened. <laughs> so there's video. Yeah, then, evidence, we'll, then we'll guys. figure it out. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's what yeah. We did. Every time I've just been collecting subscriptions, and I just can't tell the difference between them. It's probably the thing. <laughs> uh, okay, you know what? It's really my fault. I went to the um, I went to the language pack, and I renamed the two. <laughs> <laughs> that's just funny. Uh, so, Mindy, do you want to, while Luke's playing around, do you want to describe the difference between subscriptions and licensing? Um, I honestly don't know if there's a real difference. So, uh, I know what the difference should be is essentially software licenses should just be accounts. Oh, Reese can make them. <laughs> uh, so, software licenses when you've just got account really and a start date and then you're updating it. Subscriptions is being brought in to deal with NCE. So, that's where you're then bringing in terms. So because you could have like a Microsoft 365 business premium annual in a customer tenant and also have a monthly, that then lets you do the differentiation between them both. Whereas under licenses, you just see the combined total of them together. So is subscriptions brand new? Is that? Yeah, so subscriptions came in with, I think it came in when they did uh, PAX 8 things. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I know that like if you sync Microsoft CSP, the information that gets synced in goes into the software licenses tab. If you sync PAX 8, it goes into the subscriptions tab. Um, so yeah, they, it's new as PAX 8. So uh, that's a good <laughs> explanation. I don't know why they wouldn't just throw a term into the software licensing and just make it one area, but in any case. Yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense because you would, so like for us, it works quite well because we sync over our PAX 8 licenses. We can then build the annual ones annually monthly, right. monthly, map to separate items. And then we can just sync over the software licenses, which is the combined two to map to a managed server user account. So that way we want the total of the combined for mapping one way and we'd want the individual ones for mapping to different ways. So it just oh, gives that's us- that's interesting. It gives you because, good flexibility to be able to work it. around the horrible situation Microsoft put us in. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Awesome. 
Um, so let's talk about the other side of billing, which is how do you know what to charge customers based on what time entries you're doing? So this is where there's a really cool feature, which is billing plan combinations. So you can set by default a contract, which everything should go to. Uh, so that will then be billed based on whatever's been said on there. Um, this is where it's really useful is the thing called billing templates, where you essentially build up what we're going to build up here um, under configuration billing templates, just so you can then quickly click a button and apply it to every customer. So what you want to do here is start to look at how you're going to charge for a specific time to a contract. So you can map like a specific site can have one option, a ticket types, charge rates, categories, and um, even down to what user group, I guess that's in, user covered by a contract. Um, so what we typically do is we'll use charge rates. So we'll have a load of different charge rates like on site, out of hours. Uh, what we want to do is say remote support. We want to then say don't invoice for remote support because we include all of that unlimited. Then we'd want to do, do our on-site support and we'd want to then say, charge it to the contract. So what you can have on that contract is then like two hours included a month or two hours a year or whatever you want to do. When that runs out, it will then be build a, uh, your charge rates. So you've got your global rates to say whatever your on remote support and on-site support is, but then you can also then override per customer here. So if we have a look here, uh, overriding charge rates down here. So we could say for this customer, for their on-site support, starting from the start of this month, we, uh, we want to charge them like 75 pounds an hour or something. Um, you can also do clever things here for setting like your out of office multiplier. So there's a global setting to say what your in-office hours are and what the out-of-office hours are. So we could say, if they want on-site support out of hours, we're going to charge them a 1.5 multiplier. On holiday multiplier, I don't want to be called out, so we're going to charge them five times. Um, and then contract, you can use, I assume that's if it's mapped to a contract, you can do it. I've not played with that one before. Uh, you can also then say, rather than using the, S so it's the SLA, which looks like it sets the hours for in-office and out-of-hours. Um, you can also then override and say, well, it's the agent instead. So if I've had to call up a specific person to do with something, I want them to be billed extra for out-of-hours rather than just working off the SLA. Uh, you also can then control all your rounding uh, and minimums. So you could say, well, we want to build 15 minutes minimum and we want to increment it in five minutes um, and we'll only round up. So that way you can start to do some really like quite fine grained things for customers. So the overriding charge rates aren't included in the billing plans, unfortunately. So you have to manually set those by customers if you are doing it um, or but use that, the API so, to set that. So that's the overriding charge rate, but, but this, those settings exist under charge rates themselves or do they not? Yeah. Yes. So you, all of those things that I just talked about then are configured by default on the charge rate themselves. Yeah, so right. this is just, if you're going to override them on a customer, I thought I just described them both from one go. Yeah. And so yeah, if you go back to your <laughs> Let's go back settings, to the charge rates and yeah. If you go to the actual charge rates, you've got all those same settings, which is then the global level. And it's only if you want to override them at a customer level. Right. So the idea is basically um you have different types of support that you offer, right? So like on-site support and then um remote support, and then you have emergency support, or it could even be something that that you do different types of businesses with, right? So it could be um in some cases it's msp for managed services other cases let's say you're doing security monitoring uh, if you're a security company also or it could be printer management right or uh wiring low voltage cabling um so in those cases any of the work that you would do they all have different types of rates potentially and you would build out those rates here um uh, for of what it would be as the default rates, right? And then you'd have the overriding charge rates. If you have a special agreement with a specific customer, that would be an overriding charge rate where you change the cost per of that type of charge for that customer specifically. Right? Yeah. 
yeah so there's also some settings where you can say if you want to round hidden in one of the many tick boxes somewhere um but if you want to round per time entry or per ticket so so you, you can either choose basically for each time entry that an agent does it will round it for that entry to your like nearest five minutes or it will sum together all the time entries that all agents have done on that ticket and then just round off that mm -hmm. um yeah so that's yeah. like i mean our minimum right now is we we do we charge by the every 15 minute increments right so um if we were doing it per time entry and two one person three different times put in a five minute phone call and left a voicemail then we would end up walking away with 45 minutes of work yeah right? <laughs> whereas if we're charging if we're rounding mm. up for that entire ticket then we'd end up walking away with 15 minutes of work because that's 5 10 15 and that's literally it would round up the whole tickets and not the individual time entries so mm. that's to, what luke's talking to be fair about. yeah well, okay so yeah no i'm with you um and that opens up like a wide variety of like as in manage it's by time entry like there's no other option yeah and so yeah that's something that's always really bugged me because it, i fit find it like, like super I unfair to your customers so. voicemail and i'm charging you 15 minutes i've done that three times and now i have yeah. four times i have an hour you know like right. where'd that hour come from what are you talking about but then you have yeah. to build out the the secondary option of making sure you select a different work type so that you don't properly bill 15 minutes because you did a communication work type and not just oh man in, in manage you're talking about <laughs> yeah in manage specifically yeah okay we're, we're back on halo <laughs> yeah yeah but like uh, i'm going over the cool stuff okay leave me alone <laughs> um you want to talk yeah, about the, the billing templates so yeah so billing templates this is where we were talking about those billing plans earlier it's a bit more complicated when you've got lots of different charge rates so that's where they really become useful um so when you've got things like an admin charge rate or a sales charge rate and things like that you're starting to split things off um this is what you where you can then start to just globalize it and make it a lot easier to roll out to new customers. Uh, so we can talk like default template plan. Here we want to say if you're doing on-site support with a category of account administration, I guess don't build that. Um, don't want to allow other customers' contracts to be paid so if we just select contract here in the template if there is a contract it can match to it will use that if there's no contract it will actually create a new contract for you when you set it so it's a nice quick way when you're setting up customers you go straight here set a billing plan combination and that will go make your default contract where you can then just go and tweak it and move on from there um one so of the things to point out there. about this like we're billing out he's he's right now building out building wow i keep saying building twice He's right now <laughs> building out billing criteria of what to do right now. Mm -hmm. The criteria does not, this is not, this is more of a filter, right? They don't all need to be selected. Yeah. And it's what's going to happen is that it's going to work on a descending list where the first match is going to win. Right. So you want to have a built a, a profile built out where your most specific goes on the very top. Kind of like what he's doing right now right and then the less specific the catch-all so to speak goes at the very bottom so let's say you wanted to have a specific billing rates for a category of a ticket that you're creating like especially if we're talking about the scenario where we're doing different types of work printer maintenance and msp and then uh, low voltage and all that could be different types of charge rates uh you would build it out here either based off category or ticket type or whatever it is that you're doing or even by uh, site technically speaking you can do customer site overrides here i think even yep um and then the first match is going to be the one that applies and then the second uh the, and then if it doesn't match it's going to go to the next one the next one next one until it does um and if no match occurs then it doesn't apply to a contract right it just um that, uh, it'll that be charged as prepay I think. Yeah, so it then goes on to what you've got set here so it'll be yep either use default. your global setting set it to get pay to yeah. go or, or don't, don't invoice at all exactly so that's like the final action to perform if if there's no match then do that so, so did we talk specifically about charge rates at all and yeah. uh yeah okay I'm, i i, I had to go with, i had to go <laughs> at the beginning 
<laughs> no, you were busy talking do. about another product. We were talking about charge rates. <laughs> no, I meant I was talking about specifically based on actions. You can determine the charge rate for each action. Yes. Yeah, so, cool. we covered that in the last one, I think. Yeah. 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 Just making sure. <laughs> so, yeah, you can either do it with actions. So you set like you'd have a login on site ticket action, or you can actually just expose the um, the charge type field. So engineers can select from a drop down, but yeah, it's a lot safer just to do it with actions. Yeah, there's a lot of criteria on on how you can set the charge the charge rate. Um, like Reese mentioned, also you can do it based off the agent completing that ticket. Also, um, ticket type. Yeah, but like ticket Luke was right. saying, we went over in the last call, and if you missed it, it's on our YouTube channel. By the way, if you missed our previous episode, it's on our YouTube channel. Go watch it. Um, in the previous call, we went over how you can build out workflows and actions on a ticket. The actions themselves can be programmed to set the charge rate for that action. So based off going on site or remote support or you know contacting the user or closing ticket, you can have different charge rates set automatically just by pressing that button. Just keep that in mind. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about billing? Um, does anyone have the original <laughs> layout of what we were going to talk about? Uh, you, uh, yeah, didn't, you didn't send me the list. So we're going to do contact setup, recurring invoices, and billing profiles on this one. Um, and then, and then next the next is... one was email stuff. Yep, Kyle email can stuff. talk about because he literally oh, just no. the email someplace. <laughs> Here's a preview for everything for that one. Outlook sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Okay, I think that's it for billing. Yeah, we got all the questions. There's no outstanding ones. Let us move on. Okay, before we go to the email, we have two sides of the email, right? There's inbound and outbound. Okay. Um, Luke, <laughs> do you want to reshare your screen and go through <laughs> inbound email processing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're both scared of this because it's complicated <laughs> and uh, Luke has done more of it than I have. So you're going to make him do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, I don't mind. I've had varying degrees of success but... getting the inbound process into what Kai won. <laughs> I'll just rephrase it with that. Okay. That's okay. We're doing it live, so it's probably not going to work <laughs> at all. Um, if um, you look, if you go to the configuration email, which he's already in, there's two sides to it. There's the incoming and outgoing, right? The inbound is basically literally inbound. How does the system handle emails coming in? Um, and note, one of the nice things that you can do is actually change the email start tag, the ID colon, right? So you can make that custom to your MSP. We, that was the first thing we did because we have issues with our current PSA that if someone sends in a ticket with a number that the PS is like, oh, I know that number and <laughs> assigns it to the wrong ticket. You know? So the fact that we can set the tag to only pay attention to uh, the number between these characters, you can make that whatever you want. It's very nice. Um, and the other thing is, is that you can set this to find the tag in either the subject line or the body. There's this checkbox here. Um, I'm just going to reiterate something I said on the previous call. Also, there are a lot of settings in Halo. It is extremely powerful and the documentation isn't great. So read the screen because <laughs> it will likely be the best documentation you'll find. Um, and hopefully it's clear enough to figure out what you need to do. Uh, yeah, there's a checkbox there that will allow you, you already did it, the very first one. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is that there's other settings here that you can use for controlling. So like question is what happens when someone replies to a ticket? What does that reply go to the end user, right? If someone else some, CC on ticket replies, does the original contact of the ticket get that email? And the answer is it depends on your setting <laughs> that you have. The other thing is what happens if um, the email is sent directly to an agent, to a, someone at the MSP yeah. and they want to This is one of my it. favorite things. Yep, and they want to forward it over to the support mailbox but they want it to show up as a ticket from the user, right? So there's a checkbox again to turn on that will allow the system to recognize a forward email. It'll skip the top block, jump to the forward block, and then parse the user from the, con the client user from that forward block. So these are settings you want to pay attention to and look at um, when setting up your inbound email rules. 
the other things that we can do. Now, if we actually go into the, uh, we don't have a mailbox set up. Yeah, um, so I don't know if you need a mailbox set up to do the rules or not. Don't we have, we're on a demo, so we should have the built-in. We should do, but <laughs> is it an outbound only one? I mean, you sent, did you send me an email or something? <laughs> Hold on, let me see. I'm just going to make a ticket, or you're making a ticket, yeah. What email? Um, okay, fine, do that one, I guess. <laughs> Where do you like it's going to? It's fine, it's fine. So that's because to my work email. Any one of those should be fine, really. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Submit the ticket, and let's see if I get that email that goes out. Let's see. Um, while we're waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, so hello PSA test at hello PSA that email. Oh, there's no way it's gonna receive inbound. It's no way that's coming back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not coming back. Okay, fine. Forgetting about that. Um, we need to set up a mailbox. So I can just do the um, I don't so, think we need a mailbox. I, we won't be able to show things, but we can talk through the rules. Okay, fine. All right, let's do it. Next um, time, we'll have a mailbox, I promise. <laughs> so the first cool thing about rules is on a ticket, if you've got someone who sent in a spam email and you really don't ever want to hear from them again, you can just do a click on the three dots up here. I'll get rid of that one. I click on the three dots here and do is treat as spam. And what this is now going to have done is if we go back Great. into the rules, we'll have a new blocked forever, ignore this email from anything sent from Mendy, we're just going to ignore now. So Smart. if you do- That's okay, something... everyone does that anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do accidentally block a wrong address, um, this is where you go to delete it basically. Because yeah, we've had people mark things as spam, which should not have been marked as spam. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's probably an area where you should keep an eye on if you're letting people actually treat things as spam. Uh, just have a review every now and then and make sure there's nothing stupid in there. Uh, so this is where you start to filter out and do some cool things. So we're saying, this is the name of it. What I want to do is ignore it. Uh, it's going to be first in priority. So I believe the rules will process the rules until they find one that matches and then stop. So yeah. as we set to zero, these are going to be at the top of the list. So hopefully it should just block things. Yeah, so, a, good, the, a good tip to know, by the way, whenever you're in the interface and you see a sequence uh, field like that, likely, I'm willing to bet that it processes an order of sequence and the first rule to match is going to be the one that it follows. And of course, for spam stuff that you're ignoring, you don't want it matching on a make ticket before it matches on a block email, right? So otherwise, the spam rule is not going to do anything. Uh, so here's just a simple one saying, if it's from Mendy, just ignore it. Don't do anything else. You can then filter it down. So if it's got specific words in the subject or specific words in the body, um, you can block them as well. So let's delete this and not be mean. And let's make a new rule. So one of the common ones that we use is alerts via email. So you can start to do cool things here. So you could say, if it comes into my RMM inbox, uh, matches that, uh, or comes into my alerts ones, has a sender of like security alerts at microsoft.com or whatever their security notifications are, you can come and say, well, I want it to be a security alert ticket type. And then from that ticket type, you could have specified things like specific group, specific teams for it to be assigned to, specific SLAs, the default categories, and just save a whole load of time of saying, well, I know all of these emails from this person are going to be this specific kind of thing, which needs to be assigned this way and triage this way. Just go do it for me automatically on the rules that come in. All right. So keep in mind, like we have the ability of creating, I don't know what the real number is, but potentially unlimited inbound mailboxes, right? So you could have an inbound mailbox for all your RMM alerts. You could have a separate inbound mailbox, inbound mailbox for all of your security alerts. And you have a third ML mailbox for all of your, I don't know, uh, cloud services alerts and so on and so forth. You could also make one alerts mailbox 
And then if they're all, if all three of those are coming from different from addresses, you can use the from address to filter out from that one alerts mailbox. So there's, it's very flexible about which way you can do this and how, and how you want to do it really based off your setup. Um, but that mailbox dropdown will basically say which mailbox you should be checking. And you have the option of saying any mailbox, so it doesn't matter where the alert comes in, and then just instead match on the from address and the to address or email subject or whatever. Um, is there a way, Luke, to match the alert to a client? Like, let's say we have the client ID in the body or subject of the email. So client ID, I'm not sure about, but asset, oh no, you can do search for subject for client and asset. So this should, in theory, look for customer names from the subject or asset names from the subject and then match it to that specific asset or customer as it comes in. Interesting. Um, so that's an automatic thing that's happening. You don't have to put anything in there. It's just what, looking for the name of the, of the client? Yes. I've had mixed results of it actually working or not. So you'd have to make sure your names are matched exactly in all different systems. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, I've seen. I think it's been getting more reliable recently. They were doing some work on it. Uh, it's because, yeah, I'm always, I'm normally on beta, so I get all the fun <laughs> bugs. So, <laughs> Awesome. And then you can uh, close the ticket. Mm -hmm. if it already, so, yeah. so you can match it to an existing ticket, of course, because it's, that's how like any, that's just regular ticket matching, right? Based off the tag ID. And then mm -hmm. if the ticket, if the email has a string, certain string in that email, like alert resolved or, no longer an issue or something like that. Um, you can have yeah, it so close the ticket automatically. For us, we do it um, from emails from our backup, like alerting account. Mm -hmm. And then we have, if it contains success in it, then just close it so we don't have to look at it. And then anything else, we want a ticket to see what's actually gone on. So yeah, just a good way to strip out the noise and save some time. All right. That's awesome. Then, <laughs> So the other option for matching on assets is if you switch it to match on asset tag and email body. So here you can start to do, if you've got like an email which comes in, which has like host name or something, you could do start the tag as host name, colon, space, end tag, space. And then that should pull out in theory, the host name and match that to the asset inside Halo. So Sometimes it works. I've had to talk to support a good few times to be able to get it to actually work. Uh, but yeah, when it does work, it's really useful. Because <laughs> again, for backup alerts, we can pull the host name, match that to the asset, automatically assign it to the customer, have all of that triage done for us. Got it. So when it matches the asset, it automatically chooses the customer that the asset's tied to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here comes the part you've been avoiding. And this is the even more confusing part <laughs> is you can then start to parse out data from inside email. So doing the same asset, uh, the same tag matching. So these could be HTML tags, I believe. If you've got like a ta an HTML table in the email, you can then parse out by the, the tags specific data you want and then map them to any custom fields or any fields on the ticket itself. Is so customer this an option in this dropdown? Or like client or whatever the heck it's called. All users in the client, apparently not. So I no. think this is doing. Yeah, that was a custom field gonna, to be created. Yeah. <laughs> so these are custom fields of a ticket only, basically. Yeah. So it's just you can. Yeah, it's just for extracting the data rather than doing the mapping. I think. I think the mapping yeah. needs to be done through the asset matching part. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so yeah, well, you well we could over. do categories, right? So like, uh, I saw a category in there. I think that's the. Is that the ticket categories or is that a custom field? No. Oh, no, you spelled it wrong. C-A-T-E, category, category three, look at that, right there. Okay, so yeah. So that would then map the category to a specific Set thing value between... if, okay, yeah. So choose the other match type for a second. If, all right, so if specific text is found. Yeah, okay, to... if this search, if this, so that probably works better than the, than the between tag thing. It's similar yeah. to like, Closed ticket if success exists, right? So mm -hmm. we can put a search string in there and then set the, the specific category to whatever you want based off that search string. Um, yeah, 
um, Will, Reese is correct, by the way. We, we specifically blocked access to mark ticket as a spam. It's a permission setting you can set. Um, we turn it off for everyone except for managers specifically. There's also a setting, I believe, where you can turn on that, that if a ticket's deleted, it doesn't actually get removed from the database. Um, I believe that's a setting and they're advanced maybe. And then yeah, that's what what's happen. happening is in the either the latest version or the current version, something like that. In one of the later versions, they've introduced the ability to for admins to use the interface to find deleted tickets. So in regards to your concern about what happens, like even if it does nuke the ticket, I don't think it'll nuke it from the database. Um, unless you have that enabled. <laughs> yeah. So um, one thing to note with that, if you've <laughs> not got that enabled, whenever you're writing reports, you need to, I think every exclude. table gets a like F deleted, um, an F deleted column. So you just need to make sure you do F deleted equals zero in all your report queries, or you get really weird things happening where you have deleted half completed tickets. You're like, why am I got this random overdue SLA ticket? So that was biting us oh, for a while. Okay, you're right. Sorry, I, I thought you were asking, sorry. Nick. Well, I thought you were asking about the, the original ticket you marked as spam, does that get deleted? You're correct. If the ticket is marked, if the email itself is marked as spam, then it will never make it to the database to in the first place, right? So that's definitely correct. Um, but again, that's why we control that feature in general. And then the original ticket that was marked as spam um, would be the one that, that if it gets deleted, we can just pull back. But yeah, if they, obviously, if it never makes it to the database, it never makes it to the database. Um, also, I think that setting, is that setting on or off by default? The permanently delete, permanently delete entities in the database. I think that setting is on by default. I I yeah, I thought it was on by default. I don't know if they changed that default. No, I remember I, I, I juggled I, it. That's a setting that as soon as I saw, I turned off. So yeah. I think yeah, that so. setting is on by default. You may want to go, guys, and check if you want to if you want to make sure you're not permanently deleting stuff. You want to go uncheck that. Um, anyways, should be off by default. Says Reese. I don't know. Okay, well, I'll just it double check it to be safe. On, <laughs> yeah, it was on for me, so I double check it. Yeah. Um, all right, so where were we? Email, email. Okay, so now that's inbound, right? You got inbound emails done. Outbound emails are basically uh, you have the ability to send out emails from. You can set up multiple outbound mailboxes similar to inbound, and then you have the ability of setting which client or which department or whatever sends from which uh, email account. And then the other thing is that you can actually have different groups of messages that will use the message groups are basically a collection of email templates, right? And then the email templates can be branded a specific way. So you can say that uh, one message group is in telecom and the other message group is MSP geek and the other message group is something else. And then using the same system and the same people doing the work, based off which organization they're interacting with, you can have it go out of a different message group. So the branding automatically adjusts. The technician does not have to be aware of what settings they're doing or where it's, or anything. They're just doing their normal work, following through the normal flow, and the system will automatically provide the correct branding to the client um, for what you're trying to do or need. So that's the message groups to be aware of. And then our wonderful email templates, which Kyle loves so much that he's going to go through. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not prepared for this at all. Not at all, but that's OK. Uh, <laughs> Halo has a modern, rich text email template editor. All of the other email clients that parse said fantastic, modern, HTML, rich text are still using a 1997 rendering engine uh, for everything that they use. Uh, so for example, um, I'm going to share my screen. No, I'm going to share my screen because okay. I, I slightly prepared for this. <laughs> Why y'all are discussing stuff. I don't even know what you're talking about because I was just busy doing this. Um, 
So as you can see, we have a modern looking HTML template, right? Simple, concise, it's got colors in it, it's got pictures, it's fancy. And this is just the HTML file. This is the HTML this file. This is what yeah. it looks like rendered all pretty. Right, okay. Now, let me uh, load the email client. Give me 20 minutes for some reason. <laughs> Why is taking you so long? There we go. I gotta find the Zoom sharing things. Yeah, I hate how that bar is like it's almost hidden. impossible it's, to find. Yeah, right. Uh, this is what it looks like from the web version of Outlook. That doesn't look anything look like. Nope. The and you're missing the picture. Yep. Uh, now you can download the pictures, but it looks like this with the pictures. That's it. I guess there's no <laughs> difference between this and that. So. Uh, this is a problem. <laughs> um, so there is one setting which I had to play with to get this to work. I think oh, I've, I've, I've gone, there's no settings. Like it's, this is, I have gone to the core of designing for 1997 Outlook rendering. Um, Come on, Luke, yeah, what do you say? It's, so there's a setting where you can choose if you want images to be embedded as base 64 or if you want them to be presented through the api right and okay that still doesn't it doesn't fix the actual is. the actual so this yeah, is, i remember that setting it doesn't fix the yeah. actual template issues right so no but but it, it does fix a lot of problems images. with images yeah yeah, yeah. so but that, that you got to be careful with that you so you're saying halo will render the images as base 64 and then the client and then the will, client will display them the problem base. with that is some email clients will only download a minimum amount of, like Gmail will only download Text. like 102 kilobytes worth of the email and you have to click mm. show more before it will download the full thing. So yeah, if so your if, image is 102 kilobytes, they'll just see the image. <laughs> or not even, if, if your yeah. B64 string is longer than the amount of data that's gonna get downloaded by the client, they're gonna be seeing a broken email until they click download full email and then it will fully render. Um, I, it happens to me on my mail client from newsletters and stuff all the time where I'm like, what the heck is this? And I open the whole thing and then have a virus because, you know, they trick you into getting malware. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I found a nifty tool. Uh, and this is far from a uh, recommendation to use this product. Um, <laughs> So we're gonna go back to our uh, fancy, everyone can see my fancy modern um, template, right? So uh, I'm gonna to go to the actual HTML which I have open and I'm gonna to go to templates.mailchimp slash resources slash inline CSS. I discovered that all I need to do is bake in the CSS I'm using into the actual HTML, because for some reason, again, we're in 1997. So <laughs> I Googled it, found out that there is a tool already made and I don't have to uh, parse some weird uh, like Chrome dev tools trying to hack my way in to get this to work. So I'm gonna paste the HTML and I'm gonna convert it. And it's going to give me all of my classes that I'm using into the style tags. Um, I did that and it renders fine. The problem is there's things that I'm including in my HTML template, which are not included in Outlook, like a uh, box shadow, which is a CSS tag that shows the pretty modern shadow on the edges over here. You see, it's got this nice little drop shadow on the back of the, the card. Um, that's not supported in Outlook. Um, so it just looks flat. So it looks flat. Uh, I did find another fantastic website. Uh, I gotta, I gotta scroll through my list here um, to see what the. Uh, it's it's a, a website that shows you what's supported and what's not. Like which mail clients support what? Yeah, that's cool. Um. Let's 
let's see. Yep, it's called Can I Email? So you type in the tag, like the one I was using was Box Shadow, uh, and it'll tell you it's supported on Apple Mail. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, Gmail supports it on iOS, kind of partial. It's only supported with non Gmail account. <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what is that even? <laughs> <laughs> oh that is that is, that is peak uh, but see here's my problem like it's if we go to a mac os and we're running at least 2019 02 on outlook it'll work fine it'll render it like what is this but it doesn't work anywhere else unless we go to samsung email thunderbird proton mail like all these support box shadow that's interesting um and you can do like uh margin like this is i was this is another thing i was trying to center the div uh everyone knows you have to google that seven times to figure out how to center a div tag um so it's great i can center it with margin you know the standard thing is margin auto except it's partial auto is not supported <laughs> in outlook versions it's supported in 2003 but not in 2019 <laughs> um like it's it, it, there's like a whole ton of, of of things you have to figure out uh with with the mail client and there's things there's like a foundations for email that is a uh a specific built-in system there's um uh, there's one email like a completely custom email language that you can write in that will build an html template for you but i find just using this will make it much easier than learning a new language <laughs> <laughs> uh and trying to figure out what it's going to do um but what you see in halo um halo dev right in. yeah in telecom dev dot halo psa.com oh god <laughs> You're in the now. Hold, on, hold, on, hold on i'm in a completely uh Long screen panic <laughs> i'm in a completely different um browser Oh, just copy and paste it across. Oh my God. Oh, so bright. I got to fix that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's normal to me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, so much better. Oh, I can see. Um, now I'm blind. <laughs> yeah, but that's normal. Oops. It is normal. Nor am I clicking around, guys. Uh, so I'm going to create a new template. And if I, uh, this is your rich HTML editor, blah, 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 cool stuff. Uh, I'm going to click on this. And then I'm going to copy my, this is the original, like this is the original HTML. You need to fill out a name. Um, that, that worked out well. <laughs> this is. Uh, click that. <laughs> Go back into it. There's I am, a bug with is, it, with the email template. Normal. Yeah, if you if you if you're pasting the HTML in, then it, it would be under custom, probably under custom. Uh, change your drop down. Oh, custom templates. Sorry, I'm not used to that. Yeah. And then if you're pasting your HTML in, revert back to the non HTML before you click save, as Kyle does it again. Or there you go, that actually worked. And then save it, and then it should have the template. Yeah. So like I said. I mean, this isn't exactly one-to-one -one recreation of the web version, but this is still much more modern than older email style templates. So my recommendation is to build a, an action specifically designed to email you because as much as I'm trying to get them to include test button here, <laughs> uh, they've denied my request at the, at the moment to make that happen. Uh, Reese, I'm, I'm blaming you for that. Um, so let's let's actually talk about that because what we can do with email templates like i mentioned the fact that you have different message groups and you can have automatic branding and a message group selected based off the customer and stuff like that but you can actually all have the action buttons that we were talking about on previous workflows automatically pick an email template to use when sending an email um, you could also include whether or not you want the notes that you're putting in on that action to be included in the email or whether you just want to ignore it completely. If you notice in this email template, there's a lot of dollar sign variables, the date occurred, the fault ID, um, 
first name, so on and so forth. Yeah, here is a list of the variables that are available to be used. You can use this in the subject line. You can use this in the body of the message. So that way you can template out the, bot, the email and then send out whatever information you want. If you look, there's a variable called action note, I believe. Is that right? Action note, look at that, wow. That's pretty good. Um, action note, you can just include in a template and it will literally put in the details of the, of the note that was put in by the technician who performed that action. And that's including um, the, uh, any HTML formatting of that note specifically. So if, if the technician's building out a table and showing off like, here is this and that, it's colored examples and whatnot, like it's all gonna come through. Yeah, so, so you could just go through and do this. Let me scroll up. Uh, let me just go to this because it'll be much quicker if I just gonna, just gonna. Yeah, you can literally erase everything and then just say action note, just like that. And that another, could be, yeah, go ahead. Another really cool one is the email history one. So if you put that at the bottom, that will essentially put in as an email trail all trace. the previous correspondence. Yeah. So it just makes it look far more like an email conversation. <laughs> so it was a call. <laughs> Oh, it actually looks like a it, like the email history. It doesn't look like it's yeah. not a. Oh, that's awesome. So the whole chain comes across at the end. Mm -hmm. uh oh, I gotta go to HTML for this one. Now you're gonna be breaking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I, I'm a programmer. I can code in HTML. <laughs> Let's see how that looks. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, the class not gonna see that. It's gonna render. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean, so the idea is keep in mind the templates now the, and the variables and what Kyle was saying, like there's no test button to see how it's gonna look. But yeah. when you're performing an action, two things. Number one is that the action, uh, when an email is going, when the email is being sent by the person, like it includes the action note, then that template is renderable at the time of your performing the action. It shows you a preview before you click send. And then number two, is that after it's been sent, you can also view the preview in the browser. Now, the problem is, is that the browser has a lot more functionality than the actual email clients. So what it's really gonna look like is very different from what it looks like in the browser necessarily. Um, what, we, what we can do is we can create a ticket type that is literally for email testing that has a string of actions for each email template you have and each action will, fire off that template. So that would be like a test email ticket type. And then you can just click a button and test each each uh, email template that you're tying, tying it to. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, Kyle literally just showed you how to um, tie an action to an email template with a aptly named action called send me a test email because there isn't a test button. <laughs> Everyone needs to know specifically what actions do. It needs to be I, clear and concise. I just don't think that action <laughs> button is going to be long enough to display the name. I could be wrong. <laughs> so let's see if it's just on, because uh, I didn't specify anything specific. Uh, you were going to probably go to a new ticket or something. But yeah, we'll I'm put, my name, put me in. I don't know if we're, re are, we re are we restricting ticket types to workflow that would restrict the buttons available? I don't remember. We'll find out. Scott, you're lucky Kyle answered you because I was going to tell you to get the, grab the recording and literally retype it as it's on the screen. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like uh, it's available. But the button's not here. So just go yeah. add it in. <clears throat> what ticket type was that? Uh, incident. You're going to add it in? Um, oh, I'm just going to have you do it while you're there. Oh. Actually there. Well, I wasn't. I was going to go. Gonna to go... Types. <laughs> go to incident. Are we tied to a workflow or? There is a workflow that's tied to this. Under, where's the workflow? Is it under defaults or is it under details? It's right there, incident management workflow. So go to the workflows and edit that and just throw a button on that one. What is that? Now agent actions. Actually, yeah. Yep. Add, click add and then choose agent actions or allow agent actions, the first one. And uh, then you want to choose the really long button that you literally just passed. <laughs> <That one. laughs> 
save that and then go take a look at your ticket. Here it is, test email test. Now there's the email it's gonna look like. We we edited it. I forgot. I was like, this is it, right? There's no, there's no note or anything. <laughs> no, I just wanted to test the email. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. And that's and that's how it works. And that's how it works. Why don't we just go to the action and add a note field in there real quick? How about you do that while I figure out how to get uh all right, I'm gonna do it. If I can find where I'm at. Here we go. Um, so remember, like we can put whatever custom fields we want in the action. So I'm just going to throw a field list together where it's going to add a note. And then um, can we choose? Whoa, what the heck is that? No. Oh, what is this? I'm going to add this in here and see what that field does. Kyle, I may have a better answer for you. Well, I'm stopping um, the share and you can share. No, 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 no. Just go Too back. Late. Too late. But I, I'm already done. Go go pull up the page. Refresh. How <laughs> much effort this is? <laughs> Come on. We're almost done. This is the last part, right? Okay. Fire off that action and look at the fields available to you. Click on the template button. I don't know what that is. Never mind. I thought that was the email template button, but it's not. Uh, this that would have been nice if we live. can choose the email template. Yeah. Okay. So you can include like the the body of a note here or whatever. Do some fancy stuff. Make a heading. Do marquee. You just replaced everything. I don't know if that's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Oh my God. Let's find out. Let's find out. Oh, oh, and you can change the agent during the action. So it actually it works. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> uh, shout out to Halo. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, Ooh, I don't think it's going to work in the email. Oh, send the email. Let's see what happens. Oh, this is, this is fantastic. This Anyways, could not get any better. This just shows you an example of like how to build the email template and include the notes from the It ticket. works. <laughs> we just like, that's the thing. <laughs> Most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Well, oh, you man. haven't seen the actual email. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> Is the email <laughs> itself actually scrolling? Give it a second. It was just doing, oh, it's, it's not doing it here, but it's doing it on the web. Like it's not doing Click it. In my I trust out. content. Click I trust content from Halo PSA or show block content or whatever. Like I'm seeing it scrolling across the other window. <laughs> it's just this it. pop out. <laughs> it's just this pop out. Hold on. Oh, that's really funny. Um, Reese, on, me... I got a question for you. Tim was planning, or we were planning on asking him to talk about database lookups um, and being able to set or prompt for additional things or fields are you prepared to talk about it if we bring you up so we can go back to talking about really cool things that halo can do it's kind of like the end i'll try my best all right let's do it <laughs> <laughs> stand by for uh promotes panelists welcome reese to the thunderdome Uh, you are muted, if you don't know that, just letting you know. There right. we go. There, there we is. go. I'm work working from my dad's office in the spare room, so we uh, <laughs> <laughs> go from there. That's all right. Yeah, um, far away. <laughs> um, okay, so... I've never played with them. I don't know if Luke's looked at them since Tim mentioned them in the channel. So it's going to be all on you <laughs> to go through the uh, database lookups and how they work. So from what I understand, uh, see if I get this correctly, there was a custom field 
that when populated and chosen fired another action to then prompt for something else to occur uh, to then fill in the field uh, to fill in a field automatically that was on that screen um, I think this is quite new and it's something I haven't played with yet. I can have a look. I can have a look. Um, I mean, if it's dynamic lookups, it's going to be our custom fields. Um, so it, wasn't, it was like it wasn't the dynamic lookups. It was some other crazy thing. Database lookups is what we're. I mean. It's oh, offering. okay, right. These um, things, and it basically he showed an example where he literally made a prompt appear asking for right population of a custom field, where yeah. one field triggered the database lookup to occur that prompted for something else. Did that make sense? Yeah, OK. So effectively, what it does is you can connect. I, I haven't used it myself per previously, but I know how it should work. Um, so how it should work, and I'm not going to have any sort of examples to be able to set it up right now. I don't have a SQL server to connect to. Um, but effectively, what you can do is you can connect up to, I mean, you can do the Halo database as well. <laughs> but um, if, if, you take, if you take it from a point of, effectively specifying a script or effectively saying when you're pulling X from Y, then map these fields in there. So you can say that if, as an example, you are pulling something from the Halo database and it was a specific ticket that was being linked to a specific customer, you can say that if the field of, I don't know if it was a new starter or something like that, if the field of department or mailbox issue or mailbox permissions needed to be filled out, you can fill it out using these database lookups. I've never actually used it in in practice, so I'd have to figure out how it actually works. And uh, this is where this is kind of where we need Tim instead of uh, someone who's a little bit more practiced in it. Okay. Um, yeah, the effective... example that Tim showed on the screen, oh, like on on in Slack, was basically where when you selected a user to be assigned to a license, right? It decreased the quantity of licenses available. And then when it reached a certain limit, like below five or something like that, it provided a prompt on screen saying you have less than five licenses available. Yeah, like that. I know that it's possible, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just, it's purely something I've just never played with at this point. Um, All right, well, yeah, next time so, Tim is on here, we'll make him go through it with us. I mean, and, even if even if you were to click through it, uh, click through it at this point, um, I reckon you, I don't reckon it's too bad to figure out purely because if you if you specify the fields that you're attempting to trigger it off of so when it's a specific it's custom required field, uh then if that's if that's yes then we want to know what uh, email address to wanna... scan it to so someone put together some quick sql that would basically do a lookup of users i think again i don't know how but what i'm thinking of is if scan to email is required yeah then prompt for which user to set the exactly and then you've got the custom field mappings yeah. below and then the look the lookup result options as well that you'd have to set to be able to specify where it is that you're looking it up on what it is that you're setting it to within the halo psa actual fields themselves so it's effectively you're saying that once that larger area is being ticked and it's effectively saying that it should run this lookup profile the bits below in the results is defining where it's where it's going, what it's pulling from, how it's pulling it, etc. Um, Interesting. So you've got effect, you've got the options at the bottom there, and like I say, I know it's all possible, but with regards to the actual setup of it, it's something that I just haven't dived into yet. So it'd probably take me a little bit of time to figure out, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Uh well, uh, just to let everybody know, I put the link to the uh, HTML template into GitHub. It's on the chat. So. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, um, we'll add this into the next episode because it's it's out of scope anyways for what we were planning to do. <laughs> we did cover everything that we were going to talk about. Um, so I guess it's a uh, wrap up time, right? Anything else that was there? We, we covered uh, Azure Sync, security roles. Um, invoicing, recurring invoices, license subscriptions, billing contracts, and the inbound app on emails, right? Yep. We don't have any open questions. Uh, chat seems pretty. I've, I've dealt with chat, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, everyone, thank you for coming to our second episode. Stay tuned for our third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. <laughs>
I really don't know how many we're going to have, but hopefully we'll dig in. <laughs> Ideally, they'll get more focused on a specific topic and then really dig into that topic as, as, they, get, yeah. as they get more. Um, yeah, thanks everyone stopping by. Uh, to keep everyone informed, the marquee does not work in uh, Fat Client Outlook. It only works <laughs> in the web. Uh, yeah, just to just to reiterate that. Um, Honestly, I saw that happen, and I was that without doubt <laughs> the most ridiculous thing I've seen Halo do, without doubt. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, we're going back to 1997. Halo's started there, so there's no reason why it can't continue to be there. <laughs> Okay, on that note, everyone, thanks for coming. Have a great night, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.